call this meeting to order. <clears throat> this meeting of the Hyde Park Central School District Board of Ed for October 10th, 2014. Um, this time I'll entertain a motion to enter executive session to discuss confidential matters pertaining to an employment or the future employment of a particular person and corporation. So moved. Second. Second. Don't think it matters. But no. We have a motion and a second. It was just pointed out that the date in front of me is wrong. It's the ninth. It's the Today ninth. is actually the ninth. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not seeing the week. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Motion passes. We're in executive session. this time I'd like to come out of exec can I have a motion to that effect so moved second we have a motion and a second is there any discussion all in favor motion carries uh, at this time we'll conduct the Pledge of Allegiance I have one minor modification to the agenda. Um, while we were planning to conduct this meeting, uh, we expected for the president and vice president to both be unavailable. Uh, we are uh, honored to have the vice president here. However, he is not prepared to conduct the meeting. Therefore, I would ask for a motion to appoint me as chairman for this meeting unconditionally. So move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. At this time, I know of no modifications to the agenda. May I have a motion to approve the agenda as published? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carries. Uh, Pride. Yeah, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to turn it over to Cora for uh, the universal pre-K. Uh, we, we are working on some last minute transportation issues, but other than that, uh, I'll turn it over to Cora to talk about where we are. Sure, thank you. Uh, we're very excited to announce that the class at Regina Chaley opened this week. I visited yesterday. Um, I walked in just as rest time was beginning and was very impressed to see this group of four and almost four-year-olds being very quiet, very, very quiet, um, after just three days in program. So that was exciting. And at Hyde Park Elementary, we are hoping to open on Tuesday. They did an open house today, inviting families to come in and see the space and meet some of the staff. And St. Peter's is expecting also a Tuesday start date. Um, as Dr. Fisher, Dr. Fisher, Dr. Rychek, see, time, <laughs> time does strange things. Um, as was mentioned, we are working on just a couple of last minute transportation issues, but I do want to send out um, very warm kudos to our transportation department, our facilities department, and the food service department, um, all of whom have been running right along with us at a very quick pace trying to take care of things like licensures and certificates of occupancy and who gets what lunch and how will that be delivered and all of the things that go with that, painting classrooms, moving desks. Um, and I, I have to also say Josephine Perino in my office has just been exceptional. So without the help of all of those folks, um, none of this would be happening. We are just about at half enrollment right now, so we do have number of slots still available. We had a flyer put together that I'm hoping people will now be seeing out in the community um, with the help of, again, some of our staff and spouses of some of our staff, I have to say. Um, the flyers have been distributed in all of our elementary schools, 
um, in the three sites for the classrooms and also in local pediatricians' offices, um, stop and shop, some of the, the more prominent local businesses, and we will be um, distributing those in some additional spots around town. So I do want to uh, let the public know that we still do have slots. Children must be four by December 1st. Um, and it, it may not be part of Pride, but if I may, I would also just provide the update that the board requested around the regulation having to do with the start age. Um, I did speak with someone at State Ed and I was referred to the regulation. Just as a reminder, the question was around children who are already five and so are technically eligible to begin kindergarten. Are they eligible for the universal pre-K slots? And the answer is no. Um, the regulation and the federal funding is very specifically targeted toward those children who are not yet eligible for kindergarten. And while the state and federal government acknowledge a family's right to make the decision for a child to stay home for a year, um, we are not allowed to use public funds to support that choice. Um, they likened it to the process that's used with homeschooling. So a family may choose to do homeschooling, but we don't use public funds to support that choice. So I, I did want to give that update. Um, anyone who knows of a child or has a child that would benefit is encouraged to either go on our website or go into any of our elementary schools or this building, or again, the three sites themselves and pick up an application packet. We have um, still about 70 slots available and I'd love to see all of those slots filled. Very good. Um, a couple more items. Uh, the, we had some very positive press on the Alwayas bullying program at Ralph R. Smith. It was a full day of assemblies and it was the kickoff program. Uh, the, this is through a grant through the Mediation Center locally and so uh, I know we spoke about it at the, I'm not sure if we spoke about it at the last board meeting, but um, at any rate, we were thankful for the press, thankful for the program, and the collaboration with the Mediation Center. Uh, Haviland Middle School last Friday had a safety day to coincide with the go home early drill. And they also dovetailed their entire safety day with also a breast cancer awareness um, ceremony. And they created a, a human uh, pink ribbon on the front lawn of Haviland and so if you haven't seen the pictures we certainly have some posted on our website we posted on Facebook and because of that initiative they were named Haviland Middle School was named School of the Week in one of our local newspapers and they did some nice coverage as well it it a, a stunning um, display and a lot of coordination and I understand, of course, you know, uh, Mr. Eric Shaw gets a, a lot of credit for organizing, but uh, Donna Eastman, um, one of our teachers, put in an awful lot of work on that project. So congratulations to Haviland Middle School. Uh, the Hyde Park Teachers Association held a golf tournament on September 27th. It happened to be a spectacular day. I did participate in the tournament. Unfortunately, two, or fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you looked at it, two of our partners had emergencies. One of our uh, people had a baby the night before, two nights before, so that was a legitimate excuse. And so by uh, having a team of two, we could blame all our bad shots on those who weren't there <laughs> and also take a couple of extra shots. But anyway, it was a, it was a fantastic event. They doubled the amount of money they earned. And so they were able to donate $2,200 each to the Statsburg Library and the Hyde Park Free Library. So the, it was a fundraiser for the libraries. They doubled what they did last year. And many, many thanks to Tim and Aaron Daniels, who uh, organized the entire event. And um, you see retirees, um, community members, um, all of the businesses in town pretty much sponsored some of the holes and 
uh, Cora Viva Wayne and I always sponsor a whole, so it's a real community effort, but really, again, congratulations to the HPTA, and thank you to Tim and Erin Daniels for, uh, for organizing and, and donating money to our local libraries. Very good. Thank you. We'll move on to the next agenda item, which is the superintendent's report. Yes. So um, I'd like to thank all of the community members who exercised their right to vote on uh, September 30th. Uh, the High Park Central School District went out for a referendum for, to fix the Haviland heat, and the referendum passed but with uh, 904 yes votes and 360 no votes. Again, we thank everybody who came out and exercised their right to vote. Um, as we've been publicizing all along, uh, this is to fix the Haviland Heat Project because of the lead time for state education approval so that we qualify for state aid, as well as lead time to build the infrastructure. The the project will not be complete until next winter. So um, it's really important that the community knows that their vote of approval means that the work will begin this year but will not be completed in time for this winter. Between the emergency repairs that we did last winter and maybe some partial, very small partial work that we can do before this heating season. Um, we are hopeful that we won't experience what we experienced last year, but it, it, it is possible that we may need to do some alternate scheduling should we have another severe winter and our system doesn't hold on for one more year um, until we can complete the repair. So um, we... Uh, We've, we've done all we can. We're going to do uh, hopefully one more uh, small piece of the project, but the bulk of the work will be done after this winter. So that's just an FYI. Um, we will be trying to do as much PR work as we can so that people understand that. Uh, we will also uh, be putting together all our alternate schedules and plans so that should we experience anything this winter while we're waiting for the repairs, um, we're we're um, ahead of the curve as far as alternate plans. Uh, I'd like to announce that um, at our homecoming game on Friday, October 17th, uh, we're going to have free admission for all veterans. We are go all veterans with a veteran ID. We are going to uh, have free hot dogs for any veteran, uh, for one free hot dog for each veteran with their veteran's ID, and we will have uh, a recognition um, during halftime where we ask all the veterans in uh, the audience at our homecoming game to stand and be recognized. So um, I've been working with uh, Dr. McArdle Rosenberger, our athletic director on that, so um, we're really happy to do just a little something um, we'll be contacting the American Legion and anybody else we think that can help get the word out that if they'd like to join us that evening, um, we'd like to recognize them and treat them. So, uh, One last announcement. Uh, we were approached by the Gray Smith House, which is a, a place, a home for um, women who are victims of domestic violence. And um, we have had a long-standing relationship with the Gray Smith House. They do work in all of our schools uh, at developmentally appropriate uh, presentations on um, domestic uh, violence. And so on October 27th, Monday, October 27th, um, in partnership with the Gray Smith House and Senator Terry Gibson, we will host an evening that is dedicated to the awareness of domestic violence. It's October 27th, it begins at 6 p.m. Uh, the evening will be, uh, the first portion of the evening will be a concert uh, video 
with Natalie Merchant and a victim of domestic violence. And the video will be shown, and then afterwards there will be a discussion time. Natalie Merchant will be there herself. Uh, she's a, a, a nationally recognized musician. I can't even begin to tell you how many awards Natalie Merchant has, has received, Grammys, you name it. Um, so she will be on site for the event. It is being advertised in uh, all the schools in Dutchess County, all the high schools and middle schools in Dutchess County, or at least they're provided the opportunity. Um, it is free of charge. And again, the, the focus is on the awareness of domestic violence. It happens to be um, a real focus for Natalie Merchant. Um, so we're, we're thrilled that the Gray Smith House uh, chose our site, um, the high school, to host this event. We're working out all the logistics, as you can imagine. You know, there are quite a few. Um, we're even anticipating that there may be overflow um, if there is, we, we're going to attempt to set up the auditorium similar to graduation. Maybe we can have people who, uh, if they don't get there on time to get a seat, at least get um, into the alternative site. But uh, I can't guarantee that. We have to work on the technology. Uh, we will be reserving the first two rows for the Board of Education and Administration um, and, uh, and some other personnel in the district. So. Um, again, that's October 27th, a night dedicated to the awareness of domestic violence, uh, featuring uh, an introduction by Senator Terry Gibson and Natalie Merchant herself. Um, that concludes the informal report. And the next report is pretty much verbal, um, and uh, we will look at whether or not we have to adopt the Parents' Bill of Rights um, I know we have to post the Parents' Bill of Rights, which is a misleading title. If you remember last year, there was an awful lot of discussion about data privacy and in bloom, and uh, the New York State Education Department um, pulled back on their contract with in bloom. We actually had a resolution where we were, um, we opted out of race to the top so that we wouldn't have to participate in that. And then uh, stated, uh, based on the feedback, from New York State, they uh, canceled their contract within Bloom. So that, that solved one piece of it. Um, the controversy over student data and privacy rights continues to be a topic of interest for parents and community members and educators. The State Education Department has now uh, m mandated that districts post a Parents' Bill of Rights and that will be posted online. And what that does is it explains that in moving forward and uh, possibly looking backwards, we have to have every vendor that we sign a contract with that has access to, data pr to student data that they sign an agreement with the district that the data will not be shared in, in ways that would compromise uh, student privacy. So um, there will be more on this. The State Education Department is supposed to hire a privacy officer. I don't think they've done that yet. Um, they're promising that more regulations and guidance around this topic will be available. But in the meantime, uh, we will post the Parents' Bill of Rights and we'll proceed with um, uh, having any vendor that has access to our student data uh, sign off on those. Primarily right now, um, the uh, Mid-Hudson Regional Information Center is, uh, has um, the most access to our, our student data, and they are very much on board with us. And actually, um, the Mid-Hudson Regional Information Center and the Lower Hudson Regional Information Center are collaborating on uh, managing um, how we organize all this. So um, this might not be the last time we hear about it. We will post the Bill of Rights and we'll proceed with uh, reviewing all of our contracts that um, have to do with student data. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Rychek. Next on the agenda is a presentation from uh, concerning the external audit 
uh, from O'Connor Davies LLC. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Kennedy. I'm a partner with the accounting firm O'Connor Davies. I'd like to introduce Leslie Tillotson. She's the engagement manager uh, for the audit of the Hyde Park School District, and we're pleased to be here to convey the results of the audit tonight. So I guess the first thing I'll share with you is that your financial statements, uh, which are required to be filed with the state by October 15th, will be timely filed. Um, it consists of an 80-page report, which I'm holding in my hand, and I think you all have draft copies as well. We'll be able to turn around the final copies after the conclusion of this meeting and get those to the state as well as to the trustees. But included in that report is what we refer to as our independent auditor's report. Um, and by the way, I'm going to keep it a little briefer because we, we met with your audit committee this past Monday, went through a lot more detail than we'll go through tonight but uh, we'll give you the highlights of that uh, conversation. So again, independent auditor's report is included in this, and you should be aware that the independent auditor's report reflects what is known as an auditor's unmodified opinion. So in other words, that is the terminology used by accountants to say that your financial statements present fairly in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, and we also refer to it as an auditor's clean opinion. So having said that, the financial statements also comprise other documents as well, which is management's discussion uh, and analysis. And so it's a discussion on various type things that uh, convey during the year. It also includes your government-wide financial statements, so it reflects all of the assets of the district in the financials and all of the liabilities. And then we have what we refer to as the fund level financials, and those are the things like the general fund, things that you can control. Uh, and then lastly, the notes to the financial statements. And we also, your financial statements, because you received almost $3 million in federal funding this year, you're required to have what is referred to as an A133 audit or a single audit. And we have to do two additional opinions on that information. And to cut through the chase, um, we concluded that the district um, um, appropriately used the federal funds as required. So. Having said that, maybe what I'll do is, in the interest of brevity, I'll introduce Leslie, and she could talk a little bit about the general fund. Again, this is the part of the district's funding that you can actually control. Okay. Um, I'm going to highlight the general fund, the comparative schedule of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance, budget versus actual. Um, for those of you who have the report in front of you, it's page 48. Um, it shows your original budget, which is your voter-approved budget your final budget, which includes any budget amendments or budget transfers, your actual column, your encumbrances, which are your open purchase orders at your end, and your variance column between final budget and actual. Um, your total revenues per the final budget were 82.15 million. Actual came in at 83 million, leaving, leaving you with $891,000 of excess revenues over budget. Total expenditures, final budget were 82.13 million. Actual came in at 78.5 million, leaving the district with a budgetary variance in expenditures of 3.18 million. If you add in your transfers out and your expenditures and your total revenues, there was a positive net change in fund balance of $393,000. Add that to your beginning of the year, the district ended the year with a $16.2 million fund balance. And that is broken down into um, four categories. Back to if you flip page to page 47, 47 if you're following along. So that 16 million is broken down into four categories. Uh, the first category being your non-spendable of 1.1 million, uh, restricted of 7.18 million, assigned of 3.89 million, and your unassigned of 3.99 million. And the unassigned um, New York State re uh, rec mandates actually that this should not exceed 4%. So the district is slightly over the 4% uh, at about 4.57 of the New York State uh, regulation. So it's a lot of information, but does anyone have any questions so far um, before I uh, move on? Nope. Go ahead. Right, thank, you. thank you. And again, um, went through excruciating detail with your committee <laughs> <laughs> uh, on Monday. So um, what I'll share with you next is that um, we are required to convey, uh, if there are any comments 
uh, what we refer to as management comments that rise to the level of what is a significant deficiency or a material weakness in, in, control, in controls. So we're required to convey that in writing to you. Um, but what I'll share is that we've identified uh, no such deficiencies. We identified several comments that are best practices and things like that, which we've articulated in a letter and we went through in depth on Monday. I won't uh, go through it at this point tonight. Um, then lastly, we have um, certain required communications that we should share with you when um, we're in this type of setting. And I think you're aware of what our responsibility is as your independent auditors, is ultimately to render an opinion on the financial statements. Management is responsible, and those charged with governance, the board, is in, in charge of um, maintaining an effective set of in system of internal controls and things like that. And again, if there were anything that was material, uh, a problem, I would have to convey that to you, and we did not encounter that. Um, we would have to uh, inform you if there were difficulties in performing the audit, and we had no difficulties in performing the audit. Certainly, I'd like to extend my thanks to Wayne, Linda, and Greer as well for all the courtesies extended to us during the audit, and it went very smoothly. Um, we would have to inform you if there were any um, other matters discussed with management um, prior to being retained. Um, during the year, we, we encourage management to reach out to us anytime they have a question on GAAP or financial related issues, um, and, they, and they do, and we welcome that, um, but no way, in no way does that ever jeopardize our independence. Um, we have to be a, a independent in appearance and in fact. And that's what I wanted to share with you this evening. Um, I'll see if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask us. Are the, the fund balance numbers that you presented typical for a district with uh, the kind of demographics and size that we exhibit? Um, you know, the state mandates f up to 4%. You're slightly over. That's not unusual. Um, you know, you'll probably get some uh, notification uh, from the state saying, cut it out. Uh, <laughs> stop that. Um, but, you know, I would say it's... It, it's hard to kind of align all the districts, but certainly, obviously, with the two percent, and you know, um, all all the school districts are are concerned with you know raising the taxes and stuff. So I don't I don't think that it's um, you know materially uh, different than other districts. I think you're probably in better shape than most. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I just, uh, you know, as uh, chairman of the audit committee, wanted to, you know, thank uh, Tom and Leslie for meeting with us on Monday. Doug and I uh, met uh, with them and uh, recommend uh, that we accept this tonight. It was a good, clean audit. And again, thanks to Wayne and Linda, um, you know, for their hard work. Um, you know, there's always a, a couple of comments, things we need to work on, but nothing substantial. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, always encouraging to know that, you know, really our, our finances are in as good a shape as can be possible. And, you know, um, you know, we kind of harp on the, the over the fund balance being slightly over every year, but there was many years I was on the board back in the 90s when we had next to nothing at the end of the year every year, and it was scary. Um, I'd always rather be a little over than have next to nothing laying around in the bank in case something happens. So, mm -hmm. you know, so anyway, thanks again Thank you. for your time. Thank you. Any other questions? Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> Appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. At this time, we'll receive a presentation from Wayne Kurlander on fund balance. Thanks. Hey, Leslie, thanks. <coughs> There's a lot of talk about fund balance uh, during their presentation, so one of my goals a couple years ago was to uh, present fund balance the same night so it can show the community taxpayers a little bit more in, uh, in depth uh, as to what fund balance means and why, how we came up with it. So uh, up on the board is just a little bit of definition. The fund balance is the difference uh, between our estimated revenues and our estimated expenses. And as Leslie pointed out, we were a little bit over on the uh, revenues, a little bit under on the expenses. So there is what, what we can call a planned fund balance, because you kind of want to come out with that 4% at the end of the year um, so that you have money to uh, offset the tax levy in the subsequent year. Um, the excess fund balance, as you'll see, it's always a good idea to, to let folks understand where it comes from. Um, this year, uh, th there was not as much excess fund balance as there has been in pr prior years. 
Um, but the main source of excess fund balance was a $1.1 million addition to our health insurance program through the DHIC premium holiday. It was about $222,000 difference um, that, was, uh, uh, that, that was outside of that DHIC in, in, in increase. So you can see the excess fund balance, and then you can see where the, the sources of where it is. And, and they came from such small places. I'd probably have a sheet 100 pages long to show you where each dollar came from. So I was uh, pretty uh, Wayne, straightforward. Wayne, can you just explain, um, because I, I, you know, those of us on the board know what the DHIC premium holiday is, but people out, out there and on TV, uh, you know, I, you want to explain what that sure. is and that it was a good thing that, you know, we effectively yeah. saved quite a lot of money. You just kind of walk through quickly sure. what that is. Sure. Um, we belong to a, a consortium of uh, school districts uh, under the DHIC program. It's a Duchess Educational Health in Institute, something like consortium, that. Yeah. Consortium, yeah. Consortium, yeah. Consortium, health insurance consortium. And it works just like any other business works where there's good years, bad years, and, you know, um, depending on premiums, and depending on how much money the DHIC consortium spends as a group, um, there's what, just like we have, fund balance. So if there's an inordinate, an inordinate amount of fund balance um, in our fund, we don't want to keep it there. We want to give it back to the people that pay the premiums on a regular basis. So last year in June, the, the, the problem is it's the, the timing of it doesn't really work uh, as well with budget as we would like it to, to work. We, we pass a budget in May, we find this out in June. So it's kind of a, we don't know. Like this year we're not getting it, so we won't see that up there next year. So our fund balance could look a little bit different uh, this time October next year, depending on how things work out. So but, with that but, being said, the, uh, the DHIC gives back a month free premium. So they don't charge us for the month of December um, for our premiums. So in other words, we're paying for all of our health insurance for 11 months rather than 12. And that money comes back as a revenue to our, um, to our, to our books, and an additional 1.1 million dollars. Right. So ver a very positive. Thing. Yes, a very positive. Yeah, to be over fund balance. This is a good reason to be over fund yep. balance. Yeah. Right. So it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. The um, the excess fund balance includes uh, what we did in August, a tax surgery, and I'll talk to that in a minute, of 830 thousand dollars, and um, we were over the four percent by 484 thousand dollars. Um, there's four components of fund balance. Um, they mentioned them in the last presentation, but didn't go into as much detail. Uh, but assigned fund balance is the, this represents the carried over encumbrances. At the end of the year, not everybody always spends or is able to, depending on the company, spend the money that they intended to spend in that fiscal year. So it carries over into the following year and gets added to that budget. So we have to make a line for that in our fund balance called uh, assigned fund balance. So we know that that's going to be spent Sometimes it doesn't always get spent 100% because things happen, but for the most part, our assigned fund balance is gone in the, in the first couple of months in uh, the fall. Um, Non-spendable, these are our prepaid expenses. These are things like health insurance. We pay our July in June, things like that. Um, uh, our, our, our insurance reciprocal, we pay that ahead of time. So there's some expenses that we pay out of, from one year into the next, but we have to accrue that and make sure that that works out to be in the correct year. I think I had that right. Um, restricted. This represents all the district's established reserves. I'm going to go through those in detail uh, as up to date as possible as we have them right now. And then the unassigned is that 4%. And like I said, we were are, are over a little bit there, but it's a happy problem rather than, uh, you know, I'd rather have a little bit more in the, in the bank account than less, as Kevin pointed out. Um, so the cumulative fund balance where we left off this time last year. You can see the non-spendable was 952, the restricted or reserves was 6.4, our assigned fund balance um, from 1213 was 4.4, our unassigned, or we were at exactly at 4% last year, 2.9, and then we committed $1.1 million to a technology project, which everybody is benefiting from at this point in time. We have uh, technology, um, in, in Wi-Fi and new phones in all of our buildings throughout the district, and that was that $1.1 million committed fund balance. Um, that the board decided to, to, to take care of last year. And our total is $15.8 million. Um, so our ending fund balance, looking at it the same exact way, uh, our total fund balance is 16.2, so we're up $300,000, as, as Leslie mentioned. Our non-spendable, which is our prepaid expenses, as I mentioned, is 1.1. Our carried over encumbrances is really low, thanks to Dottie Malfelli and our business office is really doing a good job, along with Linda and the folks there. Um, and making sure that people are closing out their POs and spending their POs and doing the right thing. So we're really low there at 397. 
Um, we have our designated for 1415. This is the amount of money that we uh, chose to give towards the tax levy um, to pass a, a tax levy. So $3.5 million went towards our tax levy. Our restricted is our reserves. As you can see, they went up due to that increase in August that I'll get to in a minute. And that's $7.1 million. Um, and then the unassigned, like I said, the 4%, we're up a little bit. And the amount over is the 494. Uh, 298. So if, had we come in perfect, we would have been at 39, um, but we were a little over. Um, this year's fund balance recommendation uh, in August, we have to do this each year per the comptroller's um, uh, recommendation to us is, is to establish a new tax surgery reserve. One thing we noticed, and I'm going to uh, have this probably in my journal this week to the board and to the superintendent, um, is the volume of new tax surgeries that have been coming in, almost over $2 million just in three months that has come over my desk um, and Linda's desk that is unheard of um, in comparison with other years. So the tax searches are out there, they're busy putting those claims in. Um, so we did bump up our tax surgery reserve appropriately to, uh, God forbid, some of those come through and we do have some that we've been talking about that might come through real soon. Um, so we increased that for $830,000. And our total maximum exposure is important to know is $8.5 million. So if they all came through at once, which, which would probably never happen, we would stand to be able to have to pay $8.5 million out of our, our funds. And we certainly don't have that much money in our, our, our reserves to cover that. Um, here's all the other reserves. So I just want to kind of go, go through those quickly. We have what's called EBLARS, or Reserve for Employee Benefits. Uh, and we have $1.8 million. That matches uh, exactly what, uh, you know, what, what's supposed to be there. Uh, luckily, our, our, our auditors work closely with us, and Linda does a great job together with me um, uh, in, in insisting uh, that that number is perfect, along with payroll, um, and those are reserved for employee benefits. Our ERS, which is our retirement portion, they do not for TRS, unfortunately, but if there's a bump in ERS one year, we have a reserve of $2,140,000 that uh, could help us offset those increases in the budget. So, you know, we, we're, we're stuck to a 2% tax cap or 2.4% percent or 1.8 whatever it winds up being per the formula we can dig into that to that reserve and utilize that for the increase in ERS if there happened to be a large increase in ERS in any one given year um, reserve for unemployment same thing if we had a lot of unemployment um, a lot of layoffs we've um, been in this situation before um, and uh, we have to pay to the unemployment reserve we could avoid spending from our general fund and utilize this um, fund um, for that. Luckily, we have not been um, dealing with unemployment as much because we've been uh, reducing our staff through attrition, um, so we haven't seen too much action on that. Uh, reserve for workers' compensation, the same thing. If we were to see a rate hike increase that was very high, um, and that could happen at any time, depending on, uh, on, on the way things go. Again, we're in a consortium with Dutchess County School Districts for workers' comp that I belong to and uh, meet regularly, um, and we review our numbers on a regular basis. Um, and we have a reserve there should that spike up um, and hit um, a, a year where we couldn't reach our tax cap. Um, a reserve for repairs, a uh, perfect example of that is the <laughs> Haviland Middle School heat project. Uh, we came to a point in um, February of last year where we knew we had problems that were a little bit emergency-like and beyond our control. So we were able to, uh, with a three-fourths uh, vote of the board, utilize those funds and pay them back um, this year at the end of the school year and those are back up to where they were. Reserve for tax surgery, as I mentioned, is up to $1.8 million. We added an additional 830, so we're up to $2.6 million. And that's, um, you know, if anybody wants, ever wants to see the spreadsheets about this big, <laughs> and you know, it's by year, and it's uh, maintained by several folks in, in different offices in, in our building, and it's, it's really kept up well. I'm able to use it on a daily basis because, um, you know, I am using it on a daily basis, but that, um, that is just a portion of, of what could, could happen. So the total reserves, as you see, $7.18 million. Um, we're in very good fiscal shape. The school district remains in a very good place um, in, tough to difficult, in tough and difficult times. I think um, the only thing that we'll have to deal with this year is the new government's plan for tax freeze. That'll be our, our challenge this year. Um, as, I, as I move into the year and look at my goals, I know that I'm going to have to save $586,000 somehow um, uh, through everybody in the district um, and coll collaborative efforts um, to uh, make that happen so people get their tax freeze checks. 
And with that being said, that's the conclusion of the fund balance update for this year. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Kurlander? Okay. Yes. Ah. Go ahead. I mean, uh, you mentioned a TR. There's no TRS reserve. Is there a reasoning behind that? I, I, nope, there's not. I, I, I've been begging for it forever, <laughs> like, because it would be fantastic. That's the one where we see the, the biggest waves of increases. Uh, m m more recently, in two, was it two or three years ago, where we saw like a, a jump that was like 1.6 million dollars. Linda, was it 1.6 for us? That increase, or 1.4 million dollars increase in just that line for that year. So uh, that was prior to the tax cap, thank God. Um, um, but there, there is a formula in the tax cap to save some of the TRS, but there is no reserve for TRS, and that's unfortunate. Okay, thank you. Yep. When you say no, no reserve TRS, that means we're not permitted to create one, not that we don't have one. Right. Okay. Yep. Does anyone have any further questions? Okay. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Next on the agenda is public participation. May I have a motion? So move. Second. So a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. Members of the public are welcome to address the board at this time. Please step up to the podium. Doesn't look like anybody is interested. Motion to close public participation. So move. Second. So a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. We have no items under board discussion. The meeting could conceivably be over before 8 o'clock, you realize. Now we're doomed. <laughs> At this time, I'd like, to, agenda. <laughs> I'd like to uh, entertain a motion for the consent agenda as specified in the agenda. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. This time I'd like to entertain a motion for special education placements as stated in the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? Uh, I've reviewed the package that was presented to us and recommend its adoption as, as presented to us with no changes. Very good. Thank you. Welcome back, Dan. Good to hear from you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No further discussion. All in favor? Motion carries. At this time, I'll entertain a motion for the receipt and acceptance of the external audit report as specified in the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? As indicated, we've met on Monday. Good to go. I recommend its adoption. Very good. Thank you for your work on the audit committee. Any further discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. This time, I'll entertain a motion uh, for a memorandum of understanding with the Dutchess County Health Department as specified in the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. This time we'll entertain a motion to adopt the goals as specified in the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carried. This time we'll en entertain a motion to amend the tax warrants as specified in the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Uh, do we have to re-sign these? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll be signing them tonight? Okay. So, and, what, and refresh my memory why we have to have this. Well, I, I did some research on this, and I, I called up the county to find out why every year we have to do this. Well, the first thing is that STAR doesn't come out with their final numbers till after the tax warrants are levied. How other school districts handle this is they don't put the star on the levy. His Hyde Park has historically put the star on the levy. We could choose next year, if that's the decision of the board or, or direction to me, to not put the, the, the star on the levies, and that would avoid this completely. And I would do that, but I didn't want to do that um, this year without having that conversation in public while it was going on. Wayne, would you remind us of this issue next year so that we can do that? Yeah, so I, I'd probably put a memo out that would state that this, this year's um, tax warrant won't have the star warrants, the star levies, because they're going to change, and that would avoid having to do it twice. Yeah, because I, you know, I just, you know, you know, a warrant is a, is a 
you know, it's a, it's a legal order to tax collectors to collect taxes. And so they like to do it once and, and not amend it, even though there's a, a valid reason for doing it. It doesn't change what somebody's bill is going to be individually, but it's just kind of bizarre that the tax collection, matter of fact, I think my taxes have already been paid. I, I got the notification from my, from my escrow company, and it's just weird that, you know, they're out there collecting, and now I'm, I'm reissuing a new, a new order, you know, it's just, so I, I would like to do it the way, you know, you, you know, you discussed okay. for next, next yep. year. I'll make sure that that's yep. set up for next year. Yep. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. This time we'll have a second public participation. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. Is there anyone who has changed their mind and would now like to address the board? Looks like we don't have any takers. Uh, motion to close public participation. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? All in favor? Um, I don't believe that there's any other matters deemed necessary by the board. Uh, subcommittee reports. We literally knows we covered the, the audit committee already. So yeah, that's been that met on Monday. I thought it was before the last board meeting. Okay, we reviewed the signage policy. And I don't know when we do our first reading or next board, next board meeting will be our first reading of it. Very good. Upcoming meeting upcoming meetings. Um, Friday, October seventeenth is uh, homecoming at the high school. Monday, October twentieth is the technology committee meeting, and that's at the high school library at 2.30. October 23rd, Thursday, at North Park Elementary School uh, is a board of ed meeting. That's Thursday, October 23rd. And on Monday, October 27th at 4 p.m. here at the administration office is the district leadership team meeting. Can we, um, why that's so early at four o'clock? Because of the Grace Smith um, pres presentation on domestic violence. Um, we did uh, print it on the calendar wrong, so on the calendar they're all listed at four o'clock, but we've sent out a notice saying that we would do them at six o'clock, but um, uh, that was the only date that uh, they could do that presentation, and I wasn't going to turn away Natalie Merchant and Senator Gibson. So we'll have the district leadership team before, and then um, the uh, domestic violence presentation by Grace Smith House starts at 6. And uh, did we get any parent reps from the schools? Do we have anything? None them? yet. None. And I've reached out again. And, and Jeff, I'm glad you brought it up because um, I'm really working hard to make this a, a, a a team that is a committee um, that is representative representative of all of the stakeholders from the district and um, by regulation we are supposed to go through the parent groups to seek volunteers so uh, there was a bit of a timing issue um, getting back to school and when they had their first meeting so we've reached out to them again and said that um, we would really like to have their recommendations for committee members. I did hear from the HPTA as well as the, uh, that's the Hyde Park Teachers Association and we have reps. I did hear from the Hyde Park Administrators Association and uh, we have a rep there. So, but um, we do need parent reps um, and we need parent reps that are non-employees. If you remember from last year, um, it was a, a the group of people that met really did not satisfy the, the true intention of the regulations. It was pretty much, uh, uh, and not, not to dismiss the people that came and, you know, we were productive, but it, it's, it's not what we're supposed to be doing. It was very lopsided toward one school and employees. So we are making an extra effort. Um, Again, I'll, I'll, uh, we're going to be doing some work on parent involvement later on in the year as, as per one of the goals. And I will say, we don't have a shortage of parents who 
um, come out to things that they want to come out for. We have the most vibrant booster groups that I've ever seen in areas that I haven't seen, theater, art, music. We have athletic booster groups. We have a budget input group. We have a facility steering forum. So if you're interested in the finances, athletics, arts, um, volunteering in the schools, you know, so we have so many venues for parents and I think the um, appeal if you will, uh, I uh, of the district leadership team because it's the furthest removed from a student body. Um, it, it, it's always tough, but we are making every effort we can to get the parent volunteers and we've been doing some extra reach out. So in the building leadership teams, are they meeting all their, getting their parents involved? At the, yes, at the and I level? think, uh, good, good point. Um, yes, and I think, uh, I can't guarantee all of them, but from what I've heard from the building principals, their teams are in place. There's only one that I'm not sure if they got a parent, but um, all of the building leadership teams, um, with the exception of one that I haven't heard from yet, and again, their, their, their team roster isn't due um, for another week or so, but they do have functioning building leadership teams and uh, and they do have parent reps, and so that's good. So I think you know um, we're trying to tap into a pool. Uh, if I'm a parent, do I want to sit on a district leadership team or do I want to sit on the building leadership team closest to where the students are? So um, we'll we'll keep trying, and and if not, you know I'll go back to my recommendation a couple of years ago and say that um, we can recognize that we have an overarching organization. Um, we've, we've tried so many iterations of this and uh, we, we might go back at it again. The really good news is that the building leadership teams um, last year definitely took it to the next level and this year they're poised to really do good work. They, they ended last year, I have a summary of all the building leadership teams, they're meeting, they're setting goals, they're setting SMART goals, they're linked to our um, DTSDE, that's the district, uh, uh, I'm not going to remember the, that acronym at the moment, but um, that, that's the, our guiding uh, school improvement plan as a result of being a, a focused district. We revamped the building leadership team form so that they're actually linking it to um, the tenants that are in our school improvement plan. So we we have a lot of highly functioning things and we're chipping away at this district leadership team. But what is the focus of your district leadership team? I mean, last year I was part of it and we were very focused on survey and survey results. But isn't the district leadership team supposed to be compiling all of the district and looking at the goals and even what the building, and we're supposed to be looking at overall test scores for the district? And I'm just wondering, is the focus of the district leadership team on the surveys only, just not enough to get the parents up. Yeah, well, looking for we, something as the goals, like we're looking at the, attacking the goals for graduation rates. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that something the district leadership team should be also involved in? They could be if we had a district leadership team that wanted to go in that direction. Um, what we tried, our structure previous to last year was to do the academic piece. We had two parents volunteer to be part of our academic strategic planning committee, and that is where uh, the group of individuals gets together. We have a board member on that committee and have for quite a while, we still do, so we have a board member on, on that committee. We opened that committee up to parents. Um, we had two parents that stepped forward, and then they just couldn't make the commitment for the year, and that group 100% looked at the academic goals. So um, we tried that structure. We tried to have that where it was available during the day and on the evenings, and um, you know, we, it just didn't pan out. We had two parent volunteers, and then, and then they didn't come. I will reiterate that if I'm a parent and I wanna talk about district academic goals, I'm gonna go to my building and all of the building leadership teams review the academic data for the, um, for the school and then set goals, usually they set an academic goal and then you know, an, a second goal. Um, so I'm, 
We're seeing the parents come out for the building leadership teams, and it's hard to get them to come to the overall district. No, the parents that were involved and no longer came. Did they tell you it was because of the they just didn't have the time and couldn't make the commitment? Or was there some other reason, or did you find out why they stepped away? These were highly involved parents, so they, yeah, they didn't, know. yeah, I know okay. Who you're talking yeah. about. So, um, yeah, it was the time know. commitment, even when we scheduled it at night, because traditionally strategic planning had been a, a full school day every month. Mm -hmm. um, we shifted it and had evening meetings, and my impression from their feedback was that it was a time commitment. Okay. So, the good news is our building leadership teams are highly functioning and um, we'll see where we go because I think it is important that we don't just have a committee to have a committee and um, if it's not working we'll, we'll, we'll revisit the structure we've revisited three times in the five years that I've been here in the hopes of um, getting that district leadership team going in the true sense that it's supposed to be set up so I'll keep everybody posted uh, I am committed this year that um, while we have a list of people who came last year, um, if we don't have the, the mix of parents from each of the buildings, um, it, it becomes problematic. Yep. Thanks. There is no needed need for a second executive session. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. We're adjourned. Mm -hmm.